Welcome to Chapter 6, a first look at the evolution of coronaviruses. In this chapter, we will try to unravel the origin of SARS-CoV-2. In the previous chapter, we explored the artificial origin hypothesis. Now, you might naturally ask the following. What exactly is the origin of SARS-CoV-2? To help us explore that question, we will turn to the field of phylogenetics, the study of finding evolutionary relationships between organisms. The basic principles of phylogenetics can be modeled by the intuitive diagram shown here, which is called a phylogenetic tree, or phylogeny, the formal term for an evolutionary tree. A phylogenetic tree is a diagram showing how present-day species are evolutionarily related. Before we can uncover the secrets of the phylogenetic tree, we need to understand the concept of a tree data structure, which, as we shall see, demands an understanding of the graph abstract data type. In computer science, a graph is an abstract data type that is a collection of nodes, or vertices, and edges connecting these nodes. A node is a single data point in the graph. It's one basic piece of information that a graph represents. An edge is simply a connection between two nodes, used to denote a relationship between the connected nodes. There are two types of edges. A directed edge is valid in one direction with respect to the nodes it connects. For example, a directed edge from node A, the source node, to node B, the destination node, is only valid in the stated direction from A to B, but not from B to A. Think of these like one-way streets. You can only travel across the directed edge in one direction. An undirected edge is valid in both directions with respect to the nodes it connects. For example, an undirected edge from node A, the source node, to node B, the destination node, is valid in the stated direction from A to B, as well as the reverse direction from B to A. Think of these like two-way streets. You can travel across an undirected edge in either direction. The simplest definition of a tree, then, is an undirected graph without any cycles nor any unconnected parts, such as the example shown here. We define a cycle as a path that starts and ends at the same node and does not contain any duplicate edges. You can prove to yourself that the tree here fits these criteria. In a rooted tree, a given node can have a single parent node above it and can have any number of child nodes below it. There is a single node at the top of the tree that does not have a parent, which we call the root. And there can be any number of nodes at the bottom of the tree that have no children, which we call leaves. All nodes that have at least one child are called internal nodes. Just like with a family tree, a node's parent, grandparent, and so on, all the way to the root are considered that node's ancestors. And a node's children, grandchildren, and so on, all the way to the leaves are considered the node's descendants. In the example rooted tree to the left, the root is one, the leaves are two, three, five, and six, and the internal nodes are one and four. Note that we typically draw edges in a rooted tree as pointing away from the root. In an unrooted tree, there is no notion of parents or children. Instead, a given node has neighbors. Any node with just a single neighbor is considered a leaf, and any node with more than one neighbor is considered an internal node. The leaves are two, three, five, and six, and the internal nodes are one and four. Now that we have an understanding of tree structure, let's map the components of a tree data structure onto the example rooted phylogenetic tree from earlier. In a typical phylogeny, the leaves represent present day species. The leaves in this phylogeny are orangutan, gorilla, chimpanzee, and human. The internal nodes of a typical phylogeny represent the ancestors of the leaves, and we typically assume these ancestors are extinct. The internal nodes in this phylogeny are R, X, and Y. Note that each internal node of a rooted phylogeny represents the most recent common ancestor, 
or MRCA, of all of its descendants. And the root represents the MRCA of all nodes in the phylogeny. For example, Y is the MRCA of chimpanzee and human. X is the MRCA of gorilla and Y, and thus also chimpanzee and human. And R is the MRCA of orangutan, X and Y, and thus also gorilla, chimpanzee, and human. In other words, R, which is the root of this phylogeny, is the MRCA of all nodes in the phylogeny. The edges that connect the nodes of a phylogenetic tree represent evolutionary relationships, and their lengths denote some unit of evolutionary distance. For example, millions of years, days, generations, number of mutations, and so on. Note that the direction in which a phylogeny is drawn is irrelevant. We happened to draw the root to the left and the leaves to the right in this example, so time moves forward as we move to the right of the tree. But we could have drawn the root at the top and the leaves at the bottom, so time would move forward as we move down the tree. Similarly, we could have drawn it in any other orientation. In theory, all phylogenies should be rooted trees. But in practice, modern techniques that attempt to infer the evolutionary history of multiple molecular sequences are typically only able to infer unrooted phylogenies. For example, we can represent the evolutionary history between orangutan, gorilla, chimpanzee, and human using this unrooted phylogeny. In the field of phylogenetics, an active problem of interest is tree rooting, the task of estimating the true root in an unrooted phylogeny. For example, the true root of this phylogeny, which was R in our previously seen rooted phylogeny, would be along the branch between orangutan and X. This may not be obvious at first, but try to imagine moving the nodes in two-dimensional space. Inferring the true root of an unrooted phylogeny is inherently of interest to evolutionary biologists. The root of the phylogeny is the MRCA, and inferring the true root directly informs us of the true direction of evolution across species. This is especially important in viral phylogenetics, as the root of a viral phylogeny tells us the MRCA, and thus probable origin of the viral samples we observe in an epidemic. However, the concept of tree rooting is out of the scope of this course, and you can assume that all phylogenetic trees you will be analyzing will be unrooted. You will see that unrooted trees will provide us with sufficient information for the types of questions we will be exploring in this course, and we will attempt to discover the true root of the SARS-CoV-2 phylogeny in the next course. Now that we have discussed the fundamentals of phylogenetics, it is time to investigate the origins of SARS-CoV-2. Specifically, you are likely wondering what species might have been responsible for this deadly outbreak in humans. To explore this question, we will study the evolutionary history of SARS-CoV-2 and its close relatives by attempting to infer a phylogeny. The first step in this endeavor is to identify and collect virus sequences similar to SARS-CoV-2. We will turn to BLAST, our favorite genetic search engine, as the tool for the job. Since we want to compare our SARS-CoV-2 sequence with other coronaviruses and not itself, we can explicitly exclude SARS-CoV-2 from the search results. Much like the results from any other search engine, BLAST will likely contain far more hits than we actually need, and it will sort them out using a calculated metric of relevance. In simple terms, the most relevant result will be near the top. How exactly does BLAST measure relevance such that it is able to show us the most relevant hits at the top of the results? For each potential hit, BLAST computes a metric known as bit score, which measures sequence similarity in a manner that is independent of query sequence length and database size, which is normalized by pairwise sequence alignment score. The specific details behind bit score calculation are out of the scope of this course, Regardless, BLAST will report many more hits than we want to use, and it is our job to curate this data set to include as many or as few sequences as we want. At the time of recording this video, the entry with the largest max score is named synthetic SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein measles morbilla virus, which has a max score of 2,637 and a percent identity of 100%. Should we be surprised by this? Despite the fact that we have excluded SARS-CoV-2 from our search space, the first hit is 100% identical to our query. What happened? 
if we look at the details of the stop head, you will see that the synthetic variant was created by inserting a SARS-CoV-2 S protein sequence into the measles Marbella virus genome in order to create a COVID-19 vaccine. For our purposes, given that this S protein sequence has a percent identity of 100% with respect to our own SARS-CoV-2 S protein sequence, meaning that the two sequences are identical, we can simply use this sequence to represent SARS-CoV-2 in our phylogenetic tree, which allows us to skip manually appending our own S protein sequence to the database of SARS-CoV-2 like S protein sequences that we will build. There are also quite a few bat and pangolin coronaviruses in the results. As an exploratory exercise, we can extract the top 10 most relevant sequences to use as our data set. Again, note that much like your everyday web browser search engine, the results of BLAST can change over time based on the latest sequences that have been uploaded to its database by scientists across the world. You might find that your sequence list might differ from ours, but the overall message will be the same. Note that our current data set contains a very narrow set of sequences that are extremely similar and almost identical, in fact, to SARS-CoV-2. And in order to get a broader understanding of where SARS-CoV-2 fits among its more distant coronavirus relatives, we had to run a second BLAST search that restricts the database to only include a single sequence per viral species. Each of these representative sequences is known as a reference sequence for that viral strain. Because we're only allowing one sequence per viral strain, and thus excluding the possibility of multiple identical or near identical sequences from the same species, we can expect these sequences to be far more distinct from one another than in the results of our previous search which can in fact be observed in lower percent identities as well as in lower max scores. At the time of recording this video, the entry with the largest max score is named spike glycoprotein sars coronavirus tor 2 which has a max score of 2038 and a percent identity of 75.96%. Indeed, SARS-CoV-2 is not only a relative of SARS-CoV-1, but it is also a member of a family of different coronaviruses which live in mammals. A subset of this coronaviruses live in humans, although this does not necessarily make them more likely to be closely related to SARS-CoV-2. Once we have obtained our collection of S protein sequences, we can use MAF to perform multiple sequence alignment or MSA on them. In this visualization, white spaces represent gaps and shades of green represent matches and mismatches. The darkest green represents an exact match to the most frequent amino acid in a given column and lighter shades of green represent mismatched amino acids that are increasingly different from the most frequent amino acid in the column with respect to biochemical properties. Even just looking at this alignment with our naked eye, we can see that some sequences appear to be quite similar, while others have fairly unique amino acid sequences. For example, the sequences found from the default database look very similar to one another, and on the other hand, the sequences in the reference protein sequence database appear to be quite different from our spike S protein sequence as seen here. This simple visualization of multiple sequence alignment enables us to make a quick comparison about which sequences seem to be more or less similar from one another, but it does not allow us to answer higher level questions about the evolutionary relationships between these sequences. Instead, we need to leverage a phylogenetic inference tool that will take our MSA as its input and will conduct an analysis and create a visualization which will make the answers to these questions trivial. We will use FastTree for this purpose. FastTree takes an input of a multiple sequence alignment and it produces a phylogenetic tree such as the one shown here. FastTree is a maximum likelihood phylogenetic inference tool. In short, FastTree defines a likelihood score that is essentially the likelihood that a given tree generated a given multiple sequence alignment under a given mathematical model of evolution. We simply provide FastTree the multiple sequence alignment and the mathematical model of evolution, and then FastTree searches for a tree that maximizes this likelihood score. How exactly does FastTree search for this maximum likelihood tree? The truth is FastTree uses very complex algorithms and heuristics to do so, the details of which are outside the scope of this course. If, however, you are curious about the algorithmic details behind FastTree, you can find a complete in-depth explanation on the FastTree homepage. One important comment, note that all trees outputted by FastTree, including this one here, are unrooted trees. Recall that unrooted trees only show similarity and local relationships between various strains, 
they fail to show the complete evolutionary history of these strains. For the remainder of this chapter, we will do what we can with this unrooted tree. And in future course, we will discuss the computational problem of tree rooting or the process of inferring an appropriate root or MRCA of a given unrooted phylogeny, as well as the corresponding analyses that we can conduct with this rooted tree. Note that if you try visualizing an unrooted phylogenetic tree outputted by FastTree, many visualization tools will display the tree in a way that makes it look rooted, but the rooting displayed by these visualizations is purely arbitrary. It's not necessarily the true root of the phylogeny. Be sure to keep this distinction in mind, and when visualizing unrooted trees, try to visualize them in the circular radial fashion to avoid being misled by an arbitrary root. Also note that the branch lengths in the tree outputted by fast tree are in units of normalized number of substitutions and not in units of time. The number of substitutions is correlated with time because as more time passes, more mutations will occur. But these two units are not directly proportional. We will discuss scaling a substitution tree into a time tree in future courses. But for now, keep this caveat in mind. Let us take a closer look at our tree. It is clear that the viruses extracted using the default BLAST database, also shown in green, happen to exist on leaf nodes closer to one another when compared to the viruses extracted using the reference sequence database, shown in red. This is expected because the default database, or our first BLAST search, contains sequences identical or near identical to our SARS-CoV-2 sequence, whereas the RefSeq database, or our second BLAST search, does not contain any identical or redundant sequences. Now, let us take a closer look at the animal host species of the coronavirus strains for this phylogenetic study, specifically sequences that are very close to our SARS-CoV-2 S protein sequence, or in other words, the sequences from our first BLAST search. Our SARS-CoV-2 S protein sequence is shown in green here, sequences from bat reservoirs are shown in red, and sequences from pangolin reservoirs are shown in blue. Also, the segment of the phylogeny corresponding to these sequences is circled in green. It is a bit hard to see in this visualization, but the SARS-CoV-2 S protein sequence is nested very closely within a group of bat coronavirus sequences, and the pangolin coronavirus sequences are much further away in this tree. This could possibly suggest that the bat species acted as a host for the SARS-CoV-2 virus before it was transmitted to humans. However, only looking at unrooted phylogeny rather than the rooted phylogeny with branch lengths in the unit of substitutions rather than the unit of time can be misleading to our interpretation. Further, our data set is inherently subsampled. We are only able to analyze the data that we have collected and not all possible coronavirus data has been collected to this date. There could be very well be other coronaviruses existing in animals that we simply haven't found yet. And if so, the sequences of those hypothetical coronaviruses are missing from our analyses. In the following section, we shall explore yet another theory for the origin of this virus. The last hypothesis we will explore is the intermediate host hypothesis. Having completed our analysis in the preceding section, you may deduce that the currently available data seem to align well with the direct zoonotic transfer hypothesis. The phylogenetic analysis we conducted does, at least to some extent, support this mechanism. However, there are also researchers who look at the same data and believe that it supports another theory, the intermediate host hypothesis. Let's investigate why. The intermediate host hypothesis argues that a species with which humans have regular contact was infected by bats or similar, and in turn, humans were infected by this intermediate species. It is supported by the same data that support the direct zoonotic transfer hypothesis, but it considers one additional piece of information, historical evidence. In particular, Past epidemic and pandemic outbreaks have often been attributed to the direct zoonotic transfer hypothesis during initial investigation stages, and they were then later revised to fit the intermediate host hypothesis. How is this possible? Let's consider the following hypothetical timeline. First, an epidemic is detected and biologists identify the viral species that is responsible. Second, 
Biologists perform a phylogenetic analysis that identifies the closest strain to humans as a non-mammalian species, often bats. At the time of recording this video, this stage of investigation is where we are currently at with COVID-19. It's just these two steps, they would lean toward the direct zoonotic transfer hypothesis. However, we have often seen a third event in the timeline appear, often well after the initial epidemic. Biologists discovered an intermediate between humans and the original thought species. Let's explore two relatively recent historical scenarios in which this third event occurred. We will go back to a pandemic we introduced in chapter one, the 2003 outbreak of severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS caused by virus SARS-CoV-1. During the search for the animal reservoir of SARS-CoV-1, biologists discovered infected wild civets at the Livan Animal Market in China. Meat from those animals is often added to so-called dragon tiger phoenix soup, an expensive Cantonese dish. The discovery did not greatly change the infected civet's fate. Instead of ending up in soup, they were made into SARS scapegoats and were slaughtered. However, when later searches failed to identify more SARS-infected civets, biologists started to wonder whether palm civets were truly the original source of SARS. In 2005, they discovered a SARS-like virus in Chinese horseshoe bats. The bats turned out to be SARS-CoV carriers, but they could probably only pass the virus to humans through intermediate hosts. Since bat meat is considered a delicacy and is also used in traditional Chinese medicine, bats had plenty of chances to come in close contact with civets at overcrowded live animal markets. At this stage of the SARS outbreak, both direct zoonotic transfer hypothesis and the intermediate host hypothesis were plausible. However, as biologists gathered more data and eventually constructed the evolutionary tree of coronaviruses from bats, civets, and humans, they found strong evidence that the civets were indeed intermediaries between bats and humans. In particular, they found that both the civets and human variants of SARS-CoV were nested within a bad virus phylogeny. Therefore, viewpoints were shifted towards the intermediate host hypothesis in the case of SARS-CoV-1, which remains the leading theory to this day. It is important to know that unlike uh, with the unrooted mutation tree we inferred using FAST3, this conclusion can only be made from a rooted time tree. The concepts of phylogenetic routing and dating are out of the scope of this course, and they will be discussed in the future course. For now, trust us that the tree routing shown here is accurate. Having explored the SARS-CoV-1, let us now turn to our second case study. The second outbreak of interest to the intermediate host hypothesis is the 2012 Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, epidemic which was caused by the virus MERS-CoV. Similar to SARS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV was suspected to have originated from one of two sources, either directly from bats or through a camel intermediary. Once again, we see both the direct zoonotic transfer hypothesis and intermediate host hypothesis appearing closely. Further analysis have confirmed that the camel to human transmission occurred which, given the evidence that bats do serve as reservoirs for MERS-CoV, strongly supports the intermediate host hypothesis for MERS. However, additional research suggests that both theories may be correct. In particular, that in addition to camel-to-human transmission, bat-to-human transmission may have also occurred, therefore supporting direct zoonotic transfer hypothesis. To this day, this investigation are still in progress. We hope these two cases have served as examples of why some researchers support the intermediate host hypothesis. Specifically, some researchers argue that given how long it took to find the intermediate host in the SARS and MERS outbreaks, there could be an intermediate host in the COVID-19 outbreak that we just haven't found yet. Also, keep in mind that while we focused on SARS and MERS specifically in this video, 
there are other coronaviruses which have been traced to human transmission via mammalian intermediary. Will SARS-CoV-2 will join this list? Perhaps, but only time will tell. In the next course, we will trace the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 and study its evolution within human population.